so uh, welcome everyone. Um, currently, I'm not on a stage, I'm in my kitchen. Uh, uh, the background doesn't show that, but technically I am in my kitchen. Uh, and I am being joined here by my uh, cats. So my cats uh, in the last two years has participated in pretty much all of the sessions that I've done uh, <laughs> remotely uh, and uh, we were just discussing this before the session started i think that when uh, most sessions will return to in-person sessions i'll start to take my cat everywhere around the world so that i can present the session with my cat next to me because i think that nowadays taking your cat to work is the most important thing to do anyway just um and just to mention, so um, uh, you had a quick presentation uh, about me, just to mention that uh, I've been to, to the Ukraine and to your parts of Europe, because I am physically in the opposite part, so it's, um, let's say it's this side, so I'm somewhere here in the, this way, in the corner of Europe, uh, with my cat uh, saying hello. <laughs> so I am here with my cat saying hello as well. And we are, uh, we are literally in the corner of Europe. I'm unable to point to the right place, but you get the idea. And, uh, and yes, I've been to uh, the Ukraine quite a few times, and this was always quite fun. And um, half of these sessions, at least, I've presented in Ukraine, which is always, uh, which is always very interesting uh, and very fun to do there. Okay, uh, the session for today and relating to things like big data, et cetera, um, is of course, um, upgrade your gray cells and use uh, something called Azure Synapse Analytics, which is first of all, a very strange name because um, you know half the people who are not English based have no idea what Synapse means. And this is stuff, you know, somewhere in the brain, something like that. Um, and the reality is that um, it is not that intelligent. So the, the software itself is not that intelligent, but it's, um, um, it's a very simple software that allows you to process a lot of data. So the intelligent parts come from having things like machine learning, et cetera. Uh, this is not gonna be the focus much of the things today, but I will show you how to do it as well. And then uh, with a bit more detail, these are things that you can uh, apply to Synapse Analytics as well. But from a practical point of view, we'll try to understand how Synapse Analytics works, how you can get data, how you can do some processing on the data, and then how you can basically do what they call ETL extract, transform and loads. Uh, but we know that it's never ETL. ETL, it's always something strange. You do extracting, you do transform, 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 and then maybe you do a load at the end, or sometimes you do a load in the middle and then do transform. It's always a very strange process, but uh, in the last five, 10 years, a lot of things have changed in the way that we process information. So it, it, is, uh, it is strange enough. So um, my contacts, and this is a real photo, by the way, except for the backgrounds. Uh, I was actually being choked by a uh, Borg. So this is actually true. Uh, and uh, you have my contacts there at andy.pt. Uh, later on, I'll also share my presentation slides at andy.pt slash doc. So somewhere there, I will also have my slides there as well uh, for, you to, for you to see. Uh, but in any case, uh, I won't have that many slides. I will do everything as practical as possible by doing uh, as much demos as possible. So anyway, this is literally the only slides and I will copy paste to the chats uh, and then I'll, I'll show this uh, for the presentation. Uh, I will copy paste the, the link where I got this thing from. And just to explain uh, how this works. So let's say that you have any kind of data going in and this can be the usual stuff like relational databases, which you know all of us uh, really use. Uh, and then we can even get data coming in from other sources. So let's say even other relational databases, but maybe because they're not accessible directly, you have to convert them to CSV, to JSON, even to XML. Um, you know, 20 years ago, XML was really trendy. Nowadays, much less people use XML. Uh, nowadays, everyone is used JSON, but in any case, anything is possible. So there is no limitation here. We're not discriminating any, any kind of format. Um, so you can receive data data from semi-structured formats like JSON, uh, CSV, tab-separated values, anything like that. Uh, you can also receive data from uh, other types of things like unstructured data. 
And an example of this is, let's say that you receive an image or a video or audio. Uh, although this is obviously not part of our presentation today, uh, you can take images and uh, audio and convert them into actual data. OK, so let's say if you use Azure Cognitive Services, you can take an image and detect how many faces there are, who are the people there, so you can identify the people. You can detect, oh, we have 10 people there. Uh, the age of this person is, you know, 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old. So you can detect the age of the people, uh, gray hair, dark hair, green hair, um, mustache, something like that. So you can detect all of those things and put them as data. OK, default for some of those is to turn an image into a JSON format with all of that information. You specify what you want to know, and they will provide you with a JSON, and then you do whatever you want with the JSON. Uh, but you can also do things with audio, so you can convert an audio into actual texts and then extract key phrases and things like that. Also, all of those you can do with, uh, with both speech to text and text to speech in, um, in uh, cognitive services, but then you can also uh, use things like text analytics so that you can detect the key phrases that you want uh, from the text. And that's step one to process the information. And then you can continue on to that. But from inside Synapse Analytics, you can actually call on all of these services. Um, so that's that's perfectly OK. Now, you can also do streaming, so real-time streaming of data. And uh, this would be coming from, let's say, an IoT device, you know, things like as small as a Raspberry Pi and as big as, uh, you know, some uh, IoT implementation anywhere. And if you receive the information uh, in the clouds, uh, you will be able to, to receive them. Uh, and a few ways to do it, so you can receive it in Azure IoT hubs. And uh, Azure IoT is actually one of the easiest ways to do uh, IoT because you can automatically have all of your devices, you know, automatically uh, updated and uh, with good security, everything controlled from the clouds. You have a centralized uh, Azure portal and you can control literally everything. Uh, something like each IoT device can have millions, um, sorry, each IoT hub can have millions of devices connected to it. Uh, so you can receive uh, a ton of messages and that actually fits into the category of big data. OK, uh, if you receive things from, let's say, a phone, like an application on a phone or something like that, you can eventually get them from event hubs. But the concept is the same. So you receive things like in a queue format. So you receive messages one by one, and then you have to send them to somewhere. OK, a few examples of this is you have something called Azure Stream Analytics. Please be careful because the name is notoriously similar to Synapse Analytics, very confusing, OK? But Stream Analytics came first, so many years before. Um, so uh, here you can actually process in real time all of the data. And then if you are happy with some of the processing, you can send it to Synapse Analytics to do additional processing. Now, Synapse Analytics can do either batch processing, which is, let's say, every day at night or once a week, you do all of the processing that you want, or you can do it, if you want to, in real-time format using things like Spark, OK? Uh, but we'll, we'll try to talk about Spark and all of the other ones just in a second. Let me just mention the ecosystem first, and then we'll attack this big box that we have here, OK? Uh, so all of these, you can send all of the information into uh, things like a data lake, uh, which is basically a storage account for files. You put files in there. You can have, in the case of a data lake, you can have multiple directories or folders, if you prefer, that you put all of the data inside. So that's perfectly acceptable. And then uh, you, can, you can process the data inside. Sometimes you process the data on the outside. I mentioned cognitive services here, which is very practical. There's also an additional technology called Azure Machine Learning, which visually and in terms of concepts, is not that much different from Synapse Analytics. Uh, so Azure Machine Learning is also um, you know, an orchestrator, an environment that orchestrates creating virtual machines to run you know, all of the processing, same as Synapse Analytics. And you will be able to do Azure Machine Learning uh, in a very easy way, use Python to do machine learning. But the big advantage of Azure Machine Learning uh, is to have the MLOps part. So everything, you can automate everything in a very easy way. And especially they have a really nice SDK uh, that automatically creates the infrastructure just with one line of code. Everything is very easy. So it's uh, it's very, um, 
time, it's very practical to use. Uh, it requires very little effort from you. Uh, what actually happens is that I'm assuming this is my opinion, by the way. Uh, I'm assuming that because Azure Machine Learning is so integrated with Synapse Analytics now, so we can call one from the other and vice versa. Um, and also another thing called Databricks, but I'll get to that in a second. But I'm assuming that some point in the future, Azure Machine Learning will probably be merged to Synapse Analytics. And I would find that very useful because um, if you have data that you acquire from Synapse Analytics, uh, to get it into machine learning, Azure Machine Learning is still a bit difficult, uh, but um, you can, yeah, uh, but uh, if you fully integrate it, I would be really, really happy to see it. Okay, so this might be, yeah, um, but I would read it together. Okay, uh, uh, last but not least, uh, all of the things at the consumption level. So if you are a normal user, you can consume it using things like Power BI. Uh, you can store it in things like NoSQL environments, like uh, Cosmos DB, Mongo, Andre, etc. All of these can store the information without being relational databases. So you can store the information in, let's say, denormalized way, uh, but more efficient for you to process things in big data. Funny thing is that you have an arrow to the side, but the arrow actually goes to the other side as well. So we we'll, might have time to, to actually see this for Cosmos DB as well. I will at least try. Um, you can actually have um, other data that you, you can actually share with, uh, with other people using other methods. But obviously for, for today, we'll, we'll try to focus on what's inside of this box mostly, okay? So um, this is, as I mentioned, my only slides. All of the rest is, um, is demos. Uh, so I will try to go and first of all show you that there is the same page. So just because the, the video does not capture uh, what's in the chats, so you can go to docs.microsoft.com, Azure architecture, example scenario, and then this weird thing here that uh, hopefully you can pause the video and see it. The architecture here, since I created the slide maybe a few months ago, they've actually changed visually this thing's just a bit, that's perfectly okay. Uh, but in, in reality, it's still pretty much the same slide. It's just visually slightly different. Okay, but we can actually have a look at this one now and try to focus on this box. So this box is literally what's inside of Synapse Analytics, all of the functionality that you can take advantage. Now, um, let me mention, um, uh, and this is growing, by the way, you know, every few months, there is something new in Synapse, which is actually a good thing. So you can have more possibilities of processing data more and more. Uh, one of the things, one of the things that actually happens uh, is that if you have, um, uh, if you have, let's say, an ETL process, um, you might be using, uh, by the way, I'm not sure how many people uh, watching are using things like Azure, okay, uh, but um, if you use Azure uh, and if you do ETL processes, one of the things you came across was something called Azure Data Factory, uh, which is probably one of the nicest ways uh, to, to process data, to, do, to orchestrate processing uh, an ETL process, let's call it like that. Uh, so what you do when inside of Azure Data Factory is you have some pipelines uh, and these will be, uh, they will have some boxes. Each box is an activity, or if you prefer a task, a step that you have to do. So let's say that you have multiple activities. One of them is to say, let's start some infrastructure to do some processing, like let's start a virtual machine. And obviously when we talk about this, I will mention that there are some proper virtual machines that you can start, um, or uh, let's say start the database, the data warehouse database. Uh, but let's say you start the infrastructure first, that's step number one. If everything goes okay, you step uh, you have step number two, which can be, um, let's say, get data from the original system. So one of the ones we saw here somewhere on the left, get data from here. And then step number three will be, let's process the data somewhere where we put it. And then step number four might be, okay, now that the data is processed, let's send the data somewhere, let's say Power BI, for instance. So we send the data out to somewhere that can be consumed by the user so that it can be generating reports or doing something that's actually useful because you know you can process as much as your data that you want, but if you don't use it in the end, it's just a waste of time. So obviously there has to be a human uh, result that people will actually see. 
Uh, obviously, um, when you have a pipeline, and then let's say the last step will be to turn off the infrastructure and maybe delete anything you really don't want to keep. Okay. And let's say that this process took something like one hour to do, let's say at midnight. Okay. Uh, just to keep things simple. So between midnight and one o'clock in the morning, you used a lot of infrastructure. Infrastructure was expensive. Let's say you processed a lot of things at the same time, big data. But, uh, but because you process with a lot of capacity, instead of taking five hours with a small capacity, you had, let's say, five times more capacity and you process things in only one hour. So in the end, you paid the same because you pay by the area uh, under the curve of the, the cost, let's call it like that. But, um, but at the same time, you process it faster, which is something that people want nowadays. And this is actually something that the cloud provides very easily. But what do you pay? You pay the usage. So that means that, let's say, between midnight and one o'clock in the morning, you had to pay that huge infrastructure, which was, let's say, very expensive. But then the other 23 hours, you paid zero. So that, that means that in the end, you paid something like 4% of the normal costs as if it was running 24 hours a day, 4 or 5%, right? So that's, you know, that's easy. Okay, I like that. That seems like a good thing. Uh, what if the things are late? What if it takes a bit longer? Well, the cloud doesn't care. You pay a bit more that day. The, it thinks process. In your case, if something goes wrong, you can get a warning saying, oh, it didn't take one hour. It took two hours. That's completely wrong for some reason. Uh, and then you can figure out if this is normal, if you need to fix something, etc. Or if suddenly you have to start paying more because you have a lot of data, uh, because you have more clients. But if you have more clients, you also have more money, so you can pay for a bit more. So this is always cloud proportional. Okay, so these pipelines allow you to orchestrate things. Uh, equivalent things to this would be something like you have your Windows task scheduler, you have your Linux cron, you can actually schedule things like a script, and they will actually run in sequence. So you can do the exact same thing. What's the advantage of a pipeline? Well, it's a graphical thing. It has a lot of reporting on each of the steps. You can reuse this in a very easy way. So you can create pipelines and then other pipelines, and you can call one pipeline from the other. So um, if anyone uh, watching is a developer, uh, you know that when you are a developer, you don't do all of the programming in sequence. You create functions, and then you call functions that call functions that call functions so that you organize your codes. When you have pipelines, you do the exact same thing. You have, let's say, a main pipeline, and then you have a second pipeline and a third pipeline, et cetera, so that you organize all of your code as best as possible. Okay. Um, so pipelines are easy, and the actual activities that you do, we'll have a look at what they are, but basically all of the activities are to do any kind of processing or any kind of execution of things, uh, anything that you want. So we'll have a look at what that is. One of the things that pipelines actually have as well is one of the activities can be something called data flow. And the data flow is a very simple process that um, you have a source of data, you do some data processing, and these are very similar to the equivalent of SQL commands. OK, uh, it's always graphical, but uh, you have the equivalent of a select command. You have the equivalent of a where command. You have the equivalent of uh, aggregate or a group by, if you prefer. Uh, so you have the equivalent commands of that, but it's all graphical. So it's very easy for you to set up the process, visualize the process, see which kind of things happen every, every step of the process, how much data was processed. So that's actually very easy. And um, if you are thinking, some of you might have actually worked with uh, things like uh, uh, SQL Server Integration Services. Uh, what's the difference between integration services that also have a control flow similar to pipelines and also have a data flow, which at least in concept is similar to the data flow that you have here? Well, the answer is these are two um, parallel technologies that can actually still be used. So inside of Synapse Analytics and also Data Factory, which is this big step here, you can actually do um, uh, SQL Server Integration Services packages as well. So even if you have a lot of, let's say, a thousand different packages that you can run, you can actually run them inside the pipelines as well. So that's, uh, that's also uh, something that's viable. Anyway, um, the, although it's not part of, um, of Synapse, the data lake uh, accounts store data in, uh, in um, file formats. So this can be CSV, JSON, XML, Parquet as well, which is actually very practical to store 
a lot of data and actually retrieve it in, a, in an efficient way. So that's actually very good. So data lake is one of the best options for you to store data. Uh, there, is, there is two things in Azure. There is storage accounts and there is data lake. Currently, because both of them are generation two, these are literally the same hardware, okay? They just have different optimizations in terms of accessing the files. Reading the files is the same speed. Accessing the files, finding the files, that's a big difference. Data lake is actually much faster. Okay, but in practical terms, these are the same things. Uh, although in terms of them, in terms of usage, you might have some slightly different usages in both. But assume that this will disappear in the future if this still exists. Okay. Anyway, we we have more things in Azure uh, in uh, in Azure Synapse Analytics. One of them is your uh, dedicated uh, SQL pools and your serverless SQL pools. What are these things? So a dedicated SQL pool is actually a database, a data warehouse database. That that has exactly 60 nodes, six zero, 60 nodes, plus one control node, of course. So exactly 60 data nodes plus one control node. So, okay, 61 in total. Uh, and you can actually do processing in each of the nodes. Let's say you, you store a table and you divide the table into all of the 60 nodes. And then if you need to get content from the table, each of the nodes will process the respective part, which is very easy. And then you get the data out, okay? So there are some optimizations to use dedicated uh, SQL pools. Uh, the old name of this was SQL data warehouse okay so if you hear me or anyone else just call the thing data warehouse that's probably going to be because people want to call it data warehouse dedicated sql pool seems like an absurdly strange name so just call it data warehouse if you want to you also have the serverless SQL pools, what are these? Well, while that one is um, very uh, dedicated one is actually very um, uh, similar to SQL Server, you connect on the same port, port 1433, same protocol as SQL Server. So when you go there, uh, the language is familiar, exactly like SQL Server. Most of the functionality exists, except a few things like, you don't have things like foreign keys, check constraints, etc. You don't have a lot of things that you typically would have in a normal SQL database. But this is because, you know, it's a, it's a data warehouse. You store data, but typically it's already um, validated before, or you can still do it in a separate process, but you don't have to do it at the same time. So it actually has optimizations uh, to avoid having to do that extra. So it's, so it is faster. But now the dedicated SQL pool, um, has the storage part and has some processing parts. The serverless is the same, but just has the processing parts. So where do you get the data that you need to process? You cannot have tables in serverless. You have external tables and those tables actually come from data lakes, okay? You can actually get them from things like Cosmos DB and uh, hopefully uh, things like uh, SQL databases soon, but uh, typically you get them from uh, you get them from um, data lakes, okay? And you use something which which you probably heard of, which is Polybase. So the concept is still the same as Polybase. So you create an external table, you get the data in, you analyze the data, uh, and you treat an external table like you select start from that table as if it was an external uh, as if it was a normal table but in reality every time you want it you're reading from the files directly okay so uh, there are some optimizations to do this so that you for instance if you read exactly 60 files at the same time uh, into uh, a sql pool that means that it's the most optimized way to acquire all of the data because you actually load them all in parallel to each node so there are optimizations that you can do to make this six extremely fast and copy petabytes very, very quickly, okay? Uh, but anyway, um, you also have other things in Synapse Analytics, and one of them is something called Spark Pools. So you probably heard of Spark, okay? Uh, to call them pools is weird. These are basically Spark clusters. Uh, I'm not a big fan of calling things pools, like you see them here. It's just strange, okay? But uh, if you prefer to call them Spark clusters, these are what they really are. OK, uh, so um, if you've heard of things like Databricks, uh, Databricks uh, also exists in major clouds, including Azure. Um, you also have um, Databricks, which is an orchestrator layer on top, similar to Synapse in, in reality, similar to Azure Machine Learning that you have here as well. And then they will create clusters of, in this case, uh, 
uh, Synapse it's Spark, Databricks is Spark, Azure Machine Learning is just a Linux machine with Python, that's it, or R if you prefer. Um, but um, with Spark, you actually create a cluster that inside has access to specific technology. So uh, Apache Spark actually allows you to run things like R, um, Python, uh, Scala, which is the default language for Spark. Um, and uh, all of the libraries that you have in these three languages, they are actually very similar. So they have similar syntax and things like that, at least the Spark specific ones anyway. Uh, so you always call them, let's say, spark.reads dot json for instance spark dot read dot csv this is a function and then you open parentheses specify the name and things like that and you get that if it is uh let's say if it is python you get that into a python data frame if it is one of the others you also get them into equivalent things as well uh, and then um, you can actually swap between one language and the other you can pass around those those values for instance you also have in spark something called spark sql which is basically a SQL engine, not the same as SQL Server, because these are not exactly the same, but still uses a SQL language. Uh, so you are able to, let's say, uh, create a view based on one of the, one of the uh, variables, let's say, uh, let me just create this as an example. Give me a second, uh, notepads. Let me just start a small notepad here, okay? And this is the uh, the equivalent of a whiteboard. So let's say if you say data frame is equal, to, let's say that we're doing this in Python, okay? So we are doing this in Python. Um, Python. Sometimes you have to do two, but let's say two or one, or sometimes you have to call it something like PySpark, whatever it is. Spark doesn't really matter. It's the language. So you use this either one or two depends. In Synapse, you actually use two, but let's say you use data frames equals spark dot um, read dot, um, let's say CSV, and then you put the name of a file there, um, some, uh, some account name, something, 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 whatever that is, and then slash dot uh, slash um, x dot CSV let's say. Uh, you can actually add more parameters like headers and things like that. I just want to keep it simple. So you have a data frame and then you can actually convert and um, yeah, you can actually go and create, uh, there is data, a data frame dot create, create or replace uh, temp view something creates, is it create or replace a temp view? Uh, I think that's or SQL temp view, it's one of those. Uh, I do apologize for not knowing the exact syntax, but you can tell that this is a big command. So you can do autocomplete and find it. So that's easy enough. But once you do this, you can actually go to a new, um, a new, uh, a new um, cell in your notebook. And then let's say you call it um, some view. Okay. And then you can go to your SQL and then do a select star from uh, some view. And then suddenly the content that's in this data frame in memory, physically in memory, you can actually read it from, from there. By the way, this one, I have no idea if this is the correct syntax, probably isn't, okay? But if it's something very similar to this. Anyway, uh, anyway um, you can actually access the data from one to the other. So for instance, you can run uh, a code that says PySpark uh, and then, or Python, uh, and then you run it uh, in the beginning and then you figure out, oh, I want to aggregate this, but the best way to do it is to use SQL. So you create something like this, you jump into your uh, Spark SQL world, you process something, you go back to your Python world, you process something else, and then you figure out that there is a nice library in R, in the programming language of R, that actually processes exactly what you want, and you can't find it in Python or other languages. So you jump into R, do something, and then you jump back into Python or something else, okay? So the advantage of Spark is that you can store all of the data in memory, in RAM memory, and jump around between all of these worlds, all of these programming worlds, and do the best of each in each of them. So one single notebook that has a lot of steps can actually have a lot of different programming languages. Now, you can use this in Databricks, and you can use this in Synapse Analytics, okay? It's literally the same thing. You can add more libraries, for instance, Science Analytics actually has a lot of extra libraries for Spark. One of them is the possibility of using uh, C-sharp as the programming language or .NET in general. 
which is actually very practical if you have any kind of uh, um, you know code base already in in .NET, so you can use Spark and run things that are in .NET in a very easy way. Okay. Anyway, um, disadvantages and advantages of using Spark in either Synapse or uh, in um, or in um, uh, in Databricks. So Databricks, you have to pay. Uh, so you have to well, wait a minute. Uh, you have to pay for the VM costs. So all of the virtual machines for that Spark cluster, you have to pay plus for the licenses. The license. Okay. So you have to pay for the license for Databricks. So Databricks actually has a licensing cost. However, in Synapse, uh, you just have to pay for the cost of the VM and that's it, okay? So in the end, the exact number is not exactly like this, but for small things, the difference is about 30%. So license cost is around 30% of the VM costs, okay? Which is still a reasonable number. So it's, it's possibly a good idea to, because you can do the exact same thing nowadays, you can use signups and be cheaper, okay? And plus you have all of the extra functionality that Databricks does not have. For instance, Databricks now has a few functionalities that have always existed in Azure Machine Learning, but they're only now putting them there so that people who do, uh, people who do normal machine learning will be able to use um, you know, Databricks exactly um, the same way uh, with all of the extra functionality. So I would say that at this point, uh, if you have things in Databricks, just move them to Synapse. It saves you a lot of money and you have much more functionality, okay? Now there is more so you can interact with other things. There is something called a Synapse link. So you can connect to things like Cosmos DB and more in the near future. Okay, so you can interact in the near future, you'll be able to interact with things like, I don't know, SQL databases and other sources. Data Explorer is also something that you are now able to interact as well. Um, so you can interact with all of this. Plus, if it is, let's say a pipeline, you can actually, one activity in the pipeline to actually uh, talk to Databricks, talk to Azure Machine Learning, talk to any of these, like say Data Explorer, and then you can uh, you can actually uh, make everything interact with everything. So that's actually really nice, okay? Having said this, I've said enough about the slides. Uh, you have uh, a link to the slide there as well, but now let's actually do some practical things, okay? So I think that this context was important other than to show you directly in place, so you might not be able to see it correctly. But we have this, so in any guesses what this animal is called? No idea. Uh, really nice one, nice mustaches, but uh, uh, still um, interesting animal. Okay, um, I'm kidding. I don't have any prizes or anything cool for whoever finds the name of the animal. <laughs> but uh, you can ask questions if you want to. You can go to the chat and feel free to ask questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you haven't tried the Zor yet, um, and I don't work for Microsoft, so I can be honest about what I think about these things, but Azure is actually quite nice. So if you go to Azure and you click try for free, so the green button, and then you will be able to use some of these things uh, for free for 30 days. And then after that, there's a lot of other services that might be free for 12 months. Others uh, are always free, will always be free. So they will have some free tier that you can use. We talked about things like cognitive services. They have free tiers that you can use them, you know, to learn, to try out in experiments. And if it works, you know, you put it into production and actually start to pay for it. So some of these are really nice. Um, so if you don't have an Azure account, you have no excuse, you can get it for free. Okay, having said that, let's actually go to Azure. And this is something called the Azure portal. Okay, and um, by the way, the colors are my own. So typically you have this in black and white, either white on black or black on white or some blue, but uh, I decided to make nicer colors because, you know, I'm crazy. Uh, anyway, um, I've already created uh, Synapse Analytics because it takes, uh, you know, something like 10 minutes, but I do need to explain to you uh, how it is created. So first of all, you go to Azure Synapse Analytics, you plus sign, create a resource called Azure Synapse Analytics. This is fine. Make sure it's published by Microsoft because with any other cloud service, if you search for something, something has a very similar name and suddenly you are paying a third party company for something that it is not what you want. So let's say create, and then uh, you create the Synapse Analytics workspace. So let's say that I'm creating this and 
at the time. Uh, I'm going to reproduce the steps so you can create a new resource group. This is basically where you host all of the small resources that are needed. Uh, you actually create two. One of them is just one that has the signups thing that you click on and then you manage things. And then you have an actual managed resource group that's an internal resource group uh, that actually has absolutely nothing, um, nothing that's that um, you should really be touching. So they have things like the virtual machine, you know, resources, like, you know, uh, things like virtual machine, uh, actual processing, virtual machine disks, virtual machine, uh, network interfaces, virtual networks, things like that. So they will store most of those things inside of that managed resource group. So let's give it some name to all of this. So let's say create new. And I'll actually create some new things like this. And then the other one, I'll create some name like this. And uh, this will be needed, so that's okay. Workspace name, so uh, it is typical to do a prefix of a name, but let's say Andy Synapse uh, uh, Ukraine, something like that. I've already created one, but I will show you exactly how it's done. This has to be globally unique, so you need to make sure that this is okay in terms of names. If you are in Europe, uh, which I'm assuming most of you are, uh, West Europe is still the best region, region to try it, especially if you have a free account, okay? But please be careful because some free accounts will be limited in the amount of, um, of um, uh, things that you can deploy inside of Synapse, okay? Because you have some quotas because they are free accounts. If you have a paid account, well, you pay for it, so there is no limit. Um, you might have to ask to increase the limit, but you can, you typically can do it. Anyway, you need to create a storage account or a data lake storage account. And in this case, I've already created one, but you can say create new. But I can go here and I have a data lake account already. And I have my uh, one of my um, file systems, or if you prefer containers, uh, so I've created one that says data lake already, so that's fine. So this is the first part, okay? They will say that they will give automatic permissions for some things if they are already created. That's all fine. Let's ignore this problem for now. Security is very important, but not today for this demo, okay? Now, security. You have to specify a user, so you specify some user. Don't use, don't use that default one, okay? So you can specify some crazy user, um, uh, something like that, SQL password, you write something. I'm going to fill the password, but in the end, I'm not going to create this one. It's already created, so you get the idea. Uh, in terms of networking, and this is another thing where security comes along. Uh, if you say disabled, you are putting this into a public IP address, and then you will be able to access it. Uh, however, if you say managed virtual network, you can put this inside of a closed virtual network and have security. This is the correct way to do it, of course, because, you know, this is how you should be doing it. Uh, however, because we're doing demos, I want this exposed to the internet because, you know, I want to use it from my computer, show you a lot of things, etc. but not worry about the security layers because these are not part of our problem today, okay? And then you say review create, and then obviously validation failed, the password is wrong, but once this is done, they will actually ask you things like, this is the cost of serverless. Uh, if you process one terabyte, you'll have to pay four euros and 22. And you know, this is acceptable, but this is serverless. If you have dedicated, prices are different, okay? Uh, you can actually process more and pay less or vice versa, depends on your actual usage. But for the serverless one, because you don't really have an, an actual infrastructure. You just call on Azure and somewhere in the cloud, they will process this for you. In that case, this is the costs, but because we're only processing a few kilobytes, this is not even gonna get any closer. Now, in the end, you say create, assuming that this was green, you would say create, that's all fine. And then we'll actually go and try to see that, that Synapse Analytics um, resource. So first of all, let me go here to my resource groups and actually find it. So I have this one down here, okay? Uh, so I actually have this one. So I have this resource group and guess what? I have Synapse Analytics here. Let me go back just for a bit. I've actually created another one, which is this one, like holes, et cetera. And this one, oh, um, oh no, this one is for a different thing. So wait a minute, um, Synapse knows the killer. This is the one, the internal one, currently empty, but this will grow if you add, machines, this will actually grow, 
Okay, so let's go to my synapse and uh, let's open synapse itself. Okay, so this is fun. Hopefully, this from this point on, this is easy. You have some interesting things. So um, uh, one of the things um, that you can do is uh, because I mentioned that you have um, that you have a dedicated SQL pool and the serverless SQL pool. That means you actually have the possibility of connecting to it using things like SQL Server Management Studio, Azure Data Studio, or anything that connects to SQL Server, uh, Visual Studio Code, normal Visual Studio, and the other technology. You know, so many third-party companies and. Uh, I'm not going to mention many because I know many of them also are in the Ukraine, but I, I don't want to mention names. But let's say that I want to connect to this, and this will be signups two. So options password. Oh, I don't have a database yet. Okay, well I need to create a database first. Let's let's go for that one first, of course. But uh, you can just connect to one of these, and this will be okay, hopefully. So we will try. Anyway. Um, how do you open Synapse Studio? You either click on this link or click on this one, literally the same thing. And we jump into a different um, tab, which is easier. Okay. The address is always something like this. And then it has a workspace ID. If you literally jump into just this part without the parameters, they will ask you for a wizard to say, what's your name? What's the, and then what's your subscription name? What's your you know, Synapse Analytics name, that's all very boring. Just use the direct link, much easier. Uh, they will validate your identity, but they will jump directly into the place, which is what you want. Now, uh, a few things to consider. Um, obviously, we are in Synapse. I'm going to reduce the size of this just a bit so that it fits. On the left, you have some, uh, some options, and we'll talk about each of the options here. This is actually going to be very simple. Uh, in the main page, you literally have nothing of interest apart from getting started. So you have information about uh, ingest, visualize, etc. So you have some information about this, some examples, etc. This is all really nice. Uh, because you can, you know, you can learn from this, but it, it, it's not for you to use, okay? When you want to use it, you go literally here to data. This is the best place to do it. So you have data, you have all of the other ones, and this is how you do it. Now, before I start, I actually need to create a few things that we can use. Some of these will take a few minutes to start, so we'll create everything now, okay? So let's go to manage, and I have my SQL pools, and... Um, the serverless one typically already exists. It's internally, you don't really create it, it's the built-in, but I do need to create some databases associated with this. But uh, let me create the dedicated one. Now, this one says it's 12 euros per hour, and yes, it is expensive, but if you lower the performance level to the minimum, it's one euro per hour, which is much more acceptable, right? Uh, so I'll have a dedicated SQL pool. So let's call it dedicated one, okay? So that we know it's a dedicated SQL database. Um, and it has, this is the one that has all of the 60 nodes that you can divide the information from. You have some additional settings, so you can get this from the, the data that you want to create in that database from a backup or from a restore point. I don't have any of that, okay? The only thing I might just do is change the collation. I like case insensitive, accent insensitive better because things like my name, Andre and Andre, for me, I, I want these two to be the same thing, okay? So accent insensitive is also good. Case insensitive is saying, uh, Andre and Andre are the same thing. Okay, so that's fine. So case insensitive, accent insensitive is actually something that people who are not English based that actually have accentuation like to use. So that's fine. And this is typical in SQL Server. But then you can just say review create, and then you can just say create. So we'll we'll pay one euro per hour. That's fine. Session will be over before then, so one euro is much more than acceptable, no problem. Um, but then we'll we can create as many as you want. All of this will store data. Be careful with one thing: once this is created, there's going to be a, a thing like this, but the pause button, so that you can stop the database. When you stop the database, you stop paying for that crazy amount, which can actually grow to I don't know a hundred thousand euros, two hundred thousand euros per month, something like that. So you can actually lower that price a lot if you turn off the the the, the data warehouse here. So to do that, all you have to do is turn it off, and the only thing you will be paying is just the storage parts that you are storing, not the processing parts. 
that's the expensive part. Just the, the storing part is actually just a few percent, three percent, maybe less, I don't know. Um, but it's much cheaper, okay? So that's the part that you want. So uh, when I mentioned at the beginning, that you can have a process where you start the infrastructure and then at the very end you stop the infrastructure. This is one of the things that I meant. You can start it, have it run, use it, and then turn it off at the end when you don't need to process anything else. Okay. But this is actually very important to include. So this will probably take a bit of time. So we'll we'll come back to this. Uh, spark pools or spark clusters, if you prefer. So you can get um, spark cluster one and then you can specify the size let's keep it small and in terms of sizes uh, let's say disable auto scale but then to the very minimum which in this case is three nodes okay and estimated price per hour one euro that's also fine okay um, so things like automatic pausing this is easy for you to save money so because I don't want this to pause automatically, I'll just put this to one hour, okay? Because I want this to be around during the session just in case, okay? And then I can just say review create and just say create, just because I know that sometimes things fail in demos. Uh, I'm just gonna create another one in case some re for some reason uh, I, need, uh, I need to process something and the other one is busy, something like that. So I'll actually include two just in case, all right? And then say review creates and then create, so that's fine. So I have two. Anyway, there's also Data Explorer. I don't want to go into a lot of Data Explorer, especially because that's still in preview at this moment, okay? Um, this is one of the other tools or other services that exists in Azure outside of Synapse that was also integrated inside of Synapse as well. And uh, when I mentioned Azure Machine Learning, I'm really hoping that that's gonna be another one that's gonna be added here as well. So let's hope, okay? Anyway, linked services is connectivity to other places like um, SQL databases, um, anything that you want to connect in terms of data or anything that you want to connect in terms of processing like Databricks, etc. cetera. Azure Purview is for you to uh, monitor and manage your data infrastructure overall in Azure. So this is a yet another completely different product, but it has uh, some um, access here inside of Synapse as well, makes sense, but uh, let's not go there now. Uh, in terms of uh, integration, so for you to do pipelines and things like that, they need to run automatically so that's why you have triggers. So these are schedules that you run, let's say once a day, these are called triggers. Integration runtimes are basically virtual machines. They have some weird name, but these are virtual machines that get created every time you need to run something. So that's easy enough as well, okay? Anyway, let's actually see something useful while this is being created. Let's go to data here. And uh, if you refresh, uh, okay, wait a minute, I'm having some, hard times refreshing this. So yeah, I, I'm gonna do two things. So first of all, I do need to create a SQL database. Dedicated one is there now. Uh, so I need to create a serverless database. Let's call it serverless two, okay? So I need to create it. It should show up here as well, okay? But in the meantime, let's, um, uh, oh, the, the two of them are here now. So uh, worst case, if you don't, uh, if you're not able to refresh from here, uh, because nothing is there, just click the refresh here and you will see it immediately. Sometimes this happens, not really a problem. We accept this as normal. So anyway, dedicated one, which has 60 nodes, um, has uh, tables here, but the serverless does not have tables. So this is important to mention. If you wanna go here and actually access them, uh, so you can go here to connect database engine, and then you go to Azure and you say signups to on demand, and this is serverless two, in fact. So it's serverless two, and hopefully this will connect. I've used the same password. It's already there from a previous time. So this is why I didn't need the password, um, but you can see the exact same thing. You can also go here and connect to the database engine uh, and then connect not to the on-demand, which is the serverless, but to the normal one. So signups normal one, and then I want the dedicated one. So this is the other way around. 
I want a dedicated one, so I'm going to run this here. So these two will show up here, and then I can do queries from my management studio from anywhere that I want to, anything that's SQL server based. Okay, uh, so this is easy. This one, oh, this one is still loading, so that's fine. Okay, we'll come back to that one. Okay, so uh, linked by default, you already have something. So at the very least, not this one, this one is empty, but at the very least, you already have your uh, connectivity to your primary data lake uh, connectivity. They call it the same name as you have to the workspace, but that's fine. You can get it a different name. But this one is, this ND lake, which they call primary, is actually the one where um, I configured in the wizard at the beginning. What they actually add is things like signups and temp and a few other things to it that are internal. All of the other ones I've had this before, so it's it, it's mine, okay? So this is from before, so I have had it here already. Now, uh, we are at the data here, but because I need space, if you don't mind, I'll just close this one that says data, okay? So I'll hide it a bit, okay? And I'll shrink this one a bit, okay? Because I will need the space somewhere on the right. Okay, so let's say that I wanna do, um, I can do a new SQL script or I can do um, anything else based on this, but this is boring to access from here. Let's say that you have um, something tests.csv, you right click and you say preview. And okay, this only has one thing, so it's not a good one. Let's try the sample one. The sample one preview actually has ABCD, this is supposed to be an enter. So this is a new line, although it's not visible, but this part is supposed to be a new line, new line, new line, new line. So that would be fine, but maybe we can get to a product category maybe, okay? So let's see if it works. This one is better, okay? So this one is better with column header, without column header. So this one seems okay. So let's see if this works, okay? Uh, there was one of these that actually failed the last time I tried it. So let's try it, see if it works. So preview we saw. We can send this to a SQL script and ask to see this in the SQL world, in the Microsoft SQL world, or we can create a notebook and load it into a data frame inside of Spark, okay? Because this one will take a bit more time, let's load it into a data frame first, and let's have it run, okay? Header is equal to true, so I'll add the header part here as well. Makes sense, okay? And then I will need to attach it to a Spark cluster. I've created one here. It still needs to start, it's turned off, so it needs to start. That's why it's gonna take a few minutes. Language Python, uh, which is PySpark if you prefer, but you can also call it Python. Um, and then I'm gonna load this from my data lake somewhere and then product category something. That's all fine, format CSV. So let's run it, leave it to run. It's gonna take uh, a few minutes because the actual cluster will take a few minutes to start. This makes sense. And while we're doing that, let's go into our other world, our SQL world, not our Spark world. So um, right click uh, SQL scripts, and then we can say top 100 rows, okay? And now let me just hide the properties. It's a good idea to rename the SQL script to give it a proper name so that when you save it here in the develop part, you have all of the script files, you give it a nice name, but let's, let's ignore that for demo purposes today. So anyway, um, you can also add uh, a header to this. So let me just copy paste this so you can actually have a uh, parser a format CSV, header row is equal to true, okay? Um, yeah, header row is equal to true, comma, parser, oh yeah, yeah, you have to remove the parser version, this one. So you actually have to remove this one uh, because parser version two is not a big fan of this apparently, but still, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, oh. Unicode character. Oh, so it's a different thing. So no, this is okay. So version two doesn't have, doesn't like some things. Okay. So hopefully this is just, okay. So top 100, we don't have a hundred. So let's try to run it. Um, by the way, I'm still using database master. So if you are familiar with SQL server, you know what this means. It's always the wrong database to run things from. But in this case, it should run, so it's not a problem, okay? So I'm able to see the data lake, and I'm able to see all of the files here, uh, all, of the, all of the records here. So these are normal, and these are SQL records, okay? So um, if you ask me, can I see all of these records from inside this one? So I can go here and actually see serverless two, which is this one. Let's say I go to my serverless two here. And if I try to run this, this will be exactly the same thing. 
so I can see it as well. Uh, can I run this exact same thing on the other sides? The answer is actually no, and I will explain why. Yeah, the answer is, but at this moment, the answer is literally no for one simple reason. So let's say new scripts. If I try to run it, I don't have the necessary credentials to see it. This is all okay. So this is okay. We can fix this. I'm not going to fix it today during the demo. It's just going to take like five minutes to find it. But if I try to run this from my management studio, it says it's missing the credential to access this data lake. So what does this mean? Well, you have a very nice and protected environment here where the user associated with this, uh, with the Synapse uh, Studio in this case, actually has um, permissions to see this data lake specifically, okay? And uh, I will show you this in Cosmos DB, how you can create that credential so that we can see it all the way up to your client application, okay? But uh, I will not do it from this, I will do it from Cosmos DB. But uh, in this case, this is very simple. So you can do a select uh, and then maybe on the other side, you would be able to see it. Assuming that you had the credential defined for the database, you'd be able to see it because I don't, uh, I only have the credentials that the studio allows me to use automatically. And in this case, this is why I can see it here, but not in the other one. I'll show you a next demo for, for Cosmos that actually shows you how to create that credential. So then you can do it from here, but let's not waste time for this. So obviously one of the other things that I can do is I can just say things like, remember that this is the serverless version, okay? serverless version. I don't have tables here because I cannot have tables. I can create, let's say, create, create view uh, categories, okay? And then as, and then select, let's call it just select star. I usually like to put the actual names there, but this is okay. And then if you wanna, this query successfully, okay. Messages here as well, so that's fine. And then you can do a select, select star from categories. And I should be able to run this. So this one should be able to run normally. And now I have a view that has categories. And if you go here to views, that should be now here. Categories are here. Categories are also here as well. So you have categories. Of course, if you try to see it, you still have the exact same problem about the credential. That's fine, we'll, we'll get to this later, okay? Um, anyway, uh, this is how to get uh, to, to access this. Let's say select top 100 rows, but now let's say that I'm using the dedicated pool and I wanna copy the table into that pool. So you can say create external table. Uh, oh, wait a minute, um, uh, before I do that, before I do that, let me create an external table. Uh, I'll still do that in the serverless one. So if that, that's okay, preview data. So I can see the data, still wrong, no, no headers. So I can, comma seems to be okay, but um, uh, infer column names. So CSV preview. So now it's okay. So I'm happy with this. And then the, the other ones I'll just keep as default. So hopefully this will work okay. Serverless database, table name. Uh, and this is an external table, uh, external table from, cat, let's say category external table from CSV. Okay, using SQL script automatically just runs. SQL script, you get to see the script before you actually run it. So they say, if not exists, and this is very poly based style. And you say you create an external file format, which in this case is the limited texts, use field separator this, etc., etc. So the usual things. Uh, so if it doesn't exist, it creates it. If it doesn't have a data source to connect to that, data uh, to that data lake you create it if uh, and then you create the external table give it the size so you have to be reasonable about the size and then it will create the thing so that's fine so hopefully this will create everything oh wait a minute i clicked on f5 force of habits so you just you just click on select database serverless 2 you run by the way this cannot be run in master because master does not allow you to create the external tables but this one, oh, bug, wait a minute. Bulk load conversion for row one, column one, big int. Okay, so apparently didn't like big int. I don't know why. Uh, it's just normal int, okay. It was just normal int, to be honest. Uh, so maybe this is the one. And so uh, I can just do a drop. 
drop table something i can actually drop the table here and then create the external one so this should be fine actually i'll probably haven't even created it yet because there was a bug right or actually they, they did allow it to create okay um so integer etc so let's see that if this works um so this actually ran object already exists select select top 100s okay so it says completed with errors but you still have a block conversion for column one product category id so for some reason um ah, okay i know what the problem is uh, the first line is considered uh, is considered uh, header but i didn't exclude that uh, that line i have to jump into the second line so that was my fault okay let's be very lazy about this varshar and this one will guarantee that things will work. So there will be no conversion issues. The best one was to would be to actually ignore the first column. But let's say I'm going to be very lazy about this. This is not the best way to do it. But honestly, I just want this to work. <laughs> uh, and still, it hasn't worked. OK. So now we've got a column four. OK. <laughs> so. Um, this one <laughs> so we'll uh we'll be here mm, okay so still not there <laughs> okay this is this seems to be taking a bit of time uh to to actually fix so maybe some conversion oh yeah because it's the header so the header doesn't like this as well uh but yeah uh because i skipped the header there's actually a much better way which is to skip x number of rows but i don't remember how that's done uh so um so this is easier for me to be lazy about this this is not the correct way so i can still see it but this is because the first row was not ignored and you still have the duplicate header but the correct way would be to for you to add here that you would ignore the first row, but I have no idea what the syntax is. If you follow the wizard, they will ask you if you want to skip it, but I didn't know the, the, the answer. So I used the really, really bad way to do it, which is just brute force it until it works, okay? Not the best answer. The best answer is to skip the first row, and we know that this is the correct way to do it, okay? Now, I've created an external table. External table is actually visible here. So if you go to external tables, you should be able to see it. You still have the same problem. So still cat table from external something CSV. You should be able to see it. So that's fine. OK, uh, now let's try something else. And this is actually the copy part, which is the most interesting part of all. So you can go here to um, scripts, create a, a bulk load. So I'm going to copy from a, a file into the dedicated SQL pool that you see here. OK, so bulk load. This will have the exact same problems in file formats, so I'll actually skip the first row. Um, first row number two, infer column names, oh, view details, oh, uh, okay. So preview date, in our first row, okay. Field terminator, preview date, that's fine. Uh, first row two, view details, cannot read properties, reading map. Okay, some incompatibility here. Okay. Uh, so I'll use a much simpler one because I'm going to just be lazy and make sure it's one that uh, I can actually see. Okay, sample.csv preview. This one hopefully works a bit better. Actually, it doesn't, but that's okay. So um, I'll actually uh, import the parquet file if that's okay. So this one has no problems with formatting. So I'll actually handle a parquet file instead. So uh, use data, uh, SQL script bulk load for the parquet file. This just has a few fields, etc. So this one will not have problems because these are all tests that I do and I use some weird separators. So sometimes this does not give you the right result. It makes me look bad at this. It's probably easier for me to just delete the whole thing and create nice examples, but you know, they tend to keep around. Anyway, you have to bulk load into a database. So to actually do that, you go to the dedicated database here, uh, table name, uh, create new. So you get it a name like uh, um, uh, bulk loads from CSV. 
So let's say category bulk load from CSV, and then the format in which you store it, this one is okay. Uh, and then automatically or with a SQL script. So we get the scripts. Uh, you, you can see that you create the table first. Okay. By the way, this distribution here is how you organize things inside of those 60 indexes. Round robin is just distributed evenly, but you can say hash and then parentheses and specify the fields so that you hash by a certain field and then put data with the same value always inside, inside the same node. And this, that is good for optimization. There's another distribution, which is replicates, which means that you, let's say for small tables, like a country's table, you literally have a copy of all of the data in all of the nodes. So that it's easier to do joins and things like that. But in this case, let's keep it simple. You actually have a command that copies for uh, registration something into column number one, other one into column number two and so on. Okay, so um, et cetera. And then we'll see if this works. So shouldn't be that long. Okay, so while this is actually copying into this, I think this is a good time to see if our demo worked. Oh, it's actually there already. So we, we can actually see that all of the data is already here, select top 100. If you go here to the database one, uh, dedicated one. So this one, if you go to tables, cat ball clothes, like top a thousand or hundreds. Uh, yeah, the session. So that's fine. Don't worry about the message. So now I have the data that I got from the parquet file. Okay. And because I'm getting the data from inside the, the dedicated uh, data warehouse, in that case, that's fine. I don't have to go to an external table like here and actually have separate credentials to authenticate myself. This is already there. I'm a, I have access to the dedicated pool, so I should have access to this as well. So this is fine, okay? Anyway, so this is okay. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, you actually have the possibility of viewing as a table or viewing as a chart, so you can change for chart and actually see. This is weird because the values are just people, okay? But you will be able to see some chart type something, so you can have all of this, but you can also have category columns, and a few other columns as well. So legend series, et cetera. So you can actually specify what you really want to see. You know, it depends on the graphics. So that's actually helpful. Messages are the usual ones. So I got a hundred records. I'm happy with this. So that's fine. Okay, let's go to the notebook and see if this works. So I ask to copy the product category, say header is equal to true, and then display the value. And I got the exact same value here um, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, of the um, categories that I was mentioning before. So this is okay. You can also do charts here. These are also very, very similar to the other ones. In this case, it's product category ID. It's not very nice, but you could configure it a bit better if you prefer, okay? Uh, but let's keep it simple, similar to the previous one. So no differences there, okay? And then you can do more with Spark. So let's say I add a new, uh, a new code, um, a new code cell or something like that so that I can add more things to it and actually continue um, with processing let's say a data frame, and then I can say um, with columns so that I can add a different column, to change something, you know, drop column, you know, something and play around with this, reduce things, aggregate, do whatever I want. Uh, so all of that would be perfectly possible to play around here. Remember that there are many languages here. So PySpark, Spark, uh, um, uh, so normal Spark language, which is Scala, uh, Spark SQL, so the SQL version uh, inside of Spark. Uh, and then you have .NET Spark, which is uh, basically C Sharp with .NET. So it works really nicely. By the way, one thing that's actually very nice to do, and I will try to do it as well, not in the other notebook, but this one, is let me say I go here to the Parquet file and I say new notebook, new Spark table. Okay. And uh, I'm actually not going to run it here. I'm going to run it in this notebook that's associated with this. Otherwise, the machine will will in the end um, fail, uh, well, the same one is already attached to this one, but the other one will take some time. So PySpark, let's say Spark reads this one, format Parquet, and then creates default dots. So my table from Parquet, okay? So let's say that I'll run this. So hopefully this is all okay. So this will take a few seconds. And somewhere here on the left, I have my dedicated pool. I have my serverless pool. And I will have another pool here, which is my Spark pool, okay? Uh, and uh, this one, uh, if I refresh, 
it will take a bit of time, but uh, once I refresh and this again takes a bit of time, it will be here. And then from here, from my Spark world, I can actually call on the serverless worlds in the Microsoft SQL worlds, and I can get data from Spark directly into the Microsoft worlds. Okay, so this is actually very nice to to be able to interact so much between all of these together. By the way, um, command executed successfully, so that's fine. For some reason, this is not showing up here. Uh, so let's, let me just try to see if this is a refresh issue and open up this in, in a new one. Maybe it is, a workspace, a SQL database. Uh, it's still not this one. Refresh, so it supposedly created this, right? So write mode, save as table. So table was here. So why isn't it visible? For some reason, it's not visible. They didn't put it here, right? That's just, did they move it? No, they didn't move it. So it should be here. Okay, I do apologize for not, oh, here we go. This is the one. Okay, sorry, my fault. Uh, it's usually in the bottom for some reason. Now it's at the top. So, you know, these are the kind of things that the interface keeps changing every day. And sometimes you will look bad, like you don't know where this is. Uh, but yeah, okay. So tables, my table from Parquet. So this one is now inside the Spark Worlds. But let's say that I want to do something with this. And this could be a new SQL script top 100 rows. So from inside SQL Server or serverless databases, I can actually go here and run this from the Parquet file and actually see the data from inside of this. And technically, again, if this was possible, because we know that in this case, I don't have the credentials, but I could literally go into this and just execute this and get stuff from Parquet. But now they complain that the permission that I need is inside the Synapse Workspaces warehouse my table from Parquet and then the Parquet files inside. So this is like a Delta Lake that you have here, okay? So um, this one, if I had the credentials to access it from here, I would be able to access things from the Spark worlds, in this, in this case, Spark SQL, inside of a normal SQL Server clients, okay? Which is spectacular, okay? Anyway, let's, let's have a look at more things. Um, so this is, few things that you can do. If you right click on this, you'll be able to do pretty much any of these things. Uh, if you start from a, if you start from a file, okay? So this is starting from a file. So you can right click new notebook. So load to data frame and new Spark table, we'll try this. Data flow and integration, we'll try some of this. All of the rest is just managing the local file. Don't worry about this. Anyway, this is uh, parts of data. When you go to develop, all of the scripts that I created will show up here, okay? But you can actually create more access just out of curiosity, still on the data now. Uh, you can actually get things from a SQL database. You can get things from a lake. Um, so these are uh, serverless and dedicated, not actual SQL server, at least not yet, maybe in the near future. Lake database, so these are the, um, you know, uh, Parquet, uh, you know, Delta-like uh, databases, but you can actually connect to external data. So this is the link that you see here. Currently, you can connect to Cosmos DB uh, with either of this to Data Explorer or to Blob Storage or Data Lake. So if I connect to a different Blob Storage, um, I can actually go there and say storage account name and get a different Blob Storage and then test connection. Hopefully it will test okay, and then create it. And then inside of this, I also have some example, test examples that have, you know, CSVs and things like that as well. So the end result will end up being the same, right? Um, one of the things that I wanna try is to get things from Cosmos DB, okay? So what I did create was that uh, I came here and I actually have a Cosmos DB, okay? Uh, so I have a Cosmos DB um, database, or, or blocks of databases. Uh, so, uh, wait a minute. Um, oh, oh, Data Explorer here. Okay. Uh, so, um, I actually created a new database uh, called Evil Database. Inside, I've created a table of people, which is empty. By the way, if you don't mind, uh, this is on the Data Explorer for Cosmos. Let me shrink this for size. 
Okay, let's go to items and let me just create a few items. By the way, um, this Cosmos DB, I'm not sure if you are familiar with this, but Cosmos DB has a lot of different versions. You can use uh, you can use Mongo, you can use Cassandra, you can use a lot of different things, and you can even uh, do global replication of all of the data. So this scales to an unlimited level, as long as you pay for it. And I can get copies, let's say if I need a copy of this in multiple places, I can actually replicate this all over the world. So that means that all of these will have a copy, okay? Uh, I'm gonna say cancel because this is not on, by the way, you can have a free tier of this, so you can try it for free. Uh, but one of the features it has is in something called Azure Synapse Link. I've enabled this already, but let's go to Data Explorer and try it out. So evil database and then uh, table people. When I create a table, you have to enable uh, to be able to see it, okay? So you have, there. there's a setting that you enable at the time, but then when you see the items, in, in the case of this one, which is the, what they call core SQL API, uh, you actually see things in, um, in a JSON format, okay? So I'll actually create a new item in JSON format, and the JSON format looks like this. So I'll actually create one here, okay? So this is a name of a person, so save, and you can have whatever field you want, of course. This is the second name of a person, so I'll copy paste. I'll just add a few of them here. So I'll add here, save. By the way, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask, okay? Uh, I hear that someone was unmuting the microphone too. You're always welcome to ask questions, okay? Uh, wait a minute, so new item three, so save. This is three, and then just two more, just because this is nice. So new item, three, save, new item, and then final one will be this one. So I have some values, doesn't really matter what it is. I have some values. If I try to do a select from this, and yes, you can do, use an equivalent language to, to SQL, although it's double quotes and things like that, because the format is JSON. So I have a lot of different fields here, plus some internal fields like timestamp when you write it, uh, record ID, which is unique record ID, self, which is also a unique ID, and the other ones that might be attachments, etc. So I need to find this and use this from uh, from inside of Synapse because let's say I have gigabytes, so, uh, not gigabytes, but tet uh, per um, petabytes of data inside of Cosmos, and I need to process it very quickly so I can send it to Synapse. So I can actually go here and get my keys, okay? And please don't copy my keys. So read-only keys. I, I will delete this after the session, so that's fine. I will have a read-only key. This can be read and write if you want to. But let's just keep it reads, okay? So I'll have a read key. I'm going to go to my synapse, go to my links, and then say that I want an external data from a table. I'm going to say SQL API, which is the core SQL API, not Mongo in this case. So Cosmos DB something, so let's say um, evil database from Cosmos and uh, subscription, Cosmos DB name this one, database name, we have to wait and that's the evil database. Test connection hopefully is okay. So you create it. However, I still need the key when I need to access, that's the credential, okay? So uh, I just created, it. it shows up here. If I click on something called refresh, Okay, and not kidding. <laughs> so this is one way for you to be able to get it. Um, so I have a Cosmos DB here, okay? Evil database, so it is here. And now in this evil database, I have a, a table of people. And from here, I can actually access it either in Spark, and that's possible. But uh, so you can see that this is perfectly possible to do in Spark, but I'll actually do it in the SQL worlds, select top 100 rows. And then if not exists credential. So if I try to run this at this moment, they will say, uh, if it doesn't exist credential, oh, you have to create a credential like this. So if I try to run it, it will go terribly wrong. By the way, let me use database serverless for all these reasons. I have a message. By the way, the key is here. Give me a second, the key is here. So uh, I do have a message saying that you need to have a key, blah, blah, blah. That looks like this. This is just a text, so you create a key. You add the key to this. And then at the end, end the quotes. And now I have a credential. So this is the credential that I needed, okay? And then select top 100 from Cosmos, where all of that's something. So I should be able to, to see 
the results here, okay? And I do, okay? So I have some internal values here, but then I have, um, let's say that I do this um, order by ID. So if I do this order by ID, I should be able to, to get what I want. So paper, rock, scissors, lizard, Spock. So we talked about this before, okay? Um, so I can see this here. And if I want to do this, I can actually, I can actually create an external table as well, but let's create an external, uh, create just a view, create view stuff from Cosmos as, and for obvious reasons, I need to remove two things. Top 100 makes, you can still keep it, but order by I need to remove it, right? Okay, so let's try this one around. And this one, hopefully, because you save the credential to that database, now if I go to this one, you should be able to see the views. So let me just refresh the views. Now I should be able to see the stuff from Cosmos. And now in my SQL client, I'm able to see stuff that's from Cosmos DB, which has a completely different infrastructure. Okay, so then if I order by ID, I will be able to see it. If I remove some of these fields that I don't want, so most of these that I don't want, I will, oh, um, one less. I will be able to see exactly the data that we had. Paper, rock, scissors, lizard, Spock. So we have uh, all of the all of the information that we need, okay? So um, we still have uh, a bit of minutes. Uh, I will have to show you a bit more, of course, okay? And one of the things that's next to show is that uh, you can actually integrate things. Um, uh, so um, um, integration data sets, I'll, I'll bring this up just in a second. Connect to external data, we talked about this, uh, but there might be more in the future. If you go to develop here, which is slightly different, by the way, uh, when I refresh the other ones because I didn't save them, I got rid of them, but that's fine. SQL scripts, uh, K, um, uh, KQ, KQL, custom query language scripts. So that's for the data explorer one. Notebook for the, for the Spark. And then a data flow, which is uh, an internal data flow. We'll try this in a second. Uh, but there was actually a few options that you can add here. One of them is a Power BI report. To do that, you have to go to the manage one. You have to go to linked services. Uh, I won't try this now, but you say new, and then you have to add the yellow one here on top, connect to Power BI. If you connect to it, you will make it available. You can actually get data from all of the other ones like Amazon, like anything you want. So all of the things that you have in Data Factory, you have here as well, okay? So you can get them from any of these. So I will actually try an integrate part at this moment. So will not develop, but integrates. I will actually create an integrate, um, a copy data tool. This will actually generate a pipeline itself, okay? And what I'll do is I'm gonna copy data from one place to the other. So what I'll do is I'll actually copy data from Connect Database Engine. I'll actually copy from, and the server to this one. So I'll actually copy from this database that you see here with something, doesn't really matter, Adventure Works. So I'll actually copy from one of these tables into a file. Okay, so I'll copy from one of these tables here, whatever that is, into a file. So let's say maybe this one has something. If this has something, this is the one I will use. If it doesn't, okay, it's hidden, but maybe um, Lucky Felines. No, I cannot show you that, it's private. Uh, so maybe a uh, customer here, okay? So I'll show this customer here. I know that this one has contents, okay? So uh, source connection, new. Let's search for SQL, Azure SQL database, okay? Continue. So the first time, oh, this is, yeah, but I don't want always encrypted, okay? What is this? Next. I don't want always encrypted. Why did this show up? And why is this... I have no idea why this is, but this is not related to our problem. This was in the this was in the management studio. I have no idea why this popped up. I don't remember talking about it or starting it, but that's fine. Uh, it's probably gonna crash. That's fine for us as well. So SQL database. So server name, I have this one or get it from the signups one, but this one is the other one. SQL database, so username, let's say if this works. Every time I do this, the passwords, I create some random passwords. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, 
cancel. Okay, so I'll have to create this as see if the password might be okay. Um, so server, that's correct. The server name, everything should be okay. So, oh, um, passwords. Okay, what's missing? Why cannot? Oh, there's something missing here. Um, server. Oh, the a SQL database, of course. I forgot to select the SQL database. Okay. So hopefully if I test this connection successful, creates. And then from here, I'm going to get one more tables. Okay. Um, so let me go and try out these table stuff. So I'm going to get this from customer. So let's say customer address. This will always be immediate products, etc. So I'll try, uh, not the description, that's very long, but let's keep it like this. And then each of these, you can actually do a preview and change this at advanced levels. You can actually do advanced changes of the data. Let's assume that we know what this is and everything's okay. Otherwise we won't have time to do all of this. And then to the targets, I can actually create a target of blob storage or something like that. But because I am inside of Synapse, and if you go to Data Factory, this is not available because I'm already inside of Synapse, I can actually go and say that I want to put this into a dedicated um, a SQL database or I'm going to put it into blob storage. And if it is blob storage, I need to specify where it's going to be. So in this case, let's say that I'm going to put this into my web container. It's actually going to be for... Um, for um, Technically, this would be a website. Instead of TXT, this will be CSV. Technically, that would be even public, uh, but let's try it here. Coma is okay. Uh, header to file, that seems very important. All of the rest, I'll keep defaults and then next, and then just uh, my copy of stuff, okay? And then uh, data consistency verification. So if it starts in CSV, it makes sense. Because this starts in a database, it's not that much of a problem. And then you have it run. Now, because uh, I, I can just have this run one time, but I can actually prepare the pipeline so that it runs on a trigger. So remember when we went down here to manage, there was something called triggers. You can associate that trigger into running this automatically. Now I can say monitor and view the results, or I can edit the pipeline. I'll show you the pipeline just in a second. So if you go here to my, um, wait a minute. If you go here to monitor, so um, my copy of stuff, you can actually restart it or you can see the contents. So I'm gonna see the contents. And in this case, there is a copy activity for each, literally each of the ones that I ran for it. So a for each runs for all of the tables and then for each table that you have here, you copy this, okay? So this makes sense, okay? So anyway, this is very simple to use. You can even, uh, by the way, you can even see this as a Gantt chart. So if you see this as a Gantt chart, you'll know that the for each started first. Actually, something started first for each, and then something like one of these copy activities. The other copy activities took a bit of time to start. But if there's too much, if there's a limit in terms of parallelization, some other ones will start later, so that's fine. But now I want to see the actual pipeline. So I can go here to the pipeline, see the pipeline, and then copy of stuff. And this is the magic of the pipelines that you also have in Data Factory. So you have a for each. The for each inside will actually have these parameters, which are the source table, etc., that got generated and the names that you want to generate into the outputs, which is which is fine. By the way, the results will be here, so linked. Um, so I'll just refresh this and we'll come back to see that the results are actually there. Uh, but in any case, inside the for each, you can actually go inside and see the activities. And there was a copy activity for each individual table. So source, source table sync each destination table and then the other one which is on the outside which is this for each will actually run based on the list of items that's actually a json file um adjacent parameter which was given to the outside which is this if i click on the outside of this this is actually the json parameter to say which kind of files what the source is, so table, what the destination is, a file for each of them, and it repeats a whole bunch of times, okay? But I can add more, so I can add a notebook. Let's say I start by running a notebook and then I run the for each, or I have a Spark job definition, I'll run something in Spark as well. 
uh, I can do a copy data. This is the one we saw before. A data flow is a different story. So data flow is the one that I mentioned that you can go inside and actually uh, start with an object and then uh, do select the where's, et cetera, and then move all the way up to the sink and just copy the data. So data flow would be an hour just to demonstrate the data flow but very interesting as well. Uh, data Explorer, so you can play around with Data Explorer as well. You can even call in Azure Functions. So let's say that in the end, you're happy with this. You want to send an email to yourself or you want to do something different. You can call an Azure Function and actually execute something. So that's fine. This is also the way that you start and stop some services. You can use an Azure Function. There's also other ways, but um, an Azure Function is the typical way. Batch service uh, allows you to run virtual machines that do big data processing, a lot of processing, but uh, you have tasks and each task will be assigned to a virtual machine. And this is like a big cluster of virtual machines for each task. This is a separate service, uh, but you can still start it. You can run Databricks notebooks if you want to. You can run Python jar, which has a lot of code inside, of course. By the way, uh, I didn't show you this, but let's say that if this goes well, it can be green. If this goes badly, it can be a different color. So if you click on this, right click one second. So if you right click on this, you'll actually be able to say on failure. And you have a blue, which is, I don't care, success or fail, go there. So you can actually say green to one, red to the other, but you can actually say two greens and two reds if you want to. All of that is okay, right? Um, so you can actually play around with this a lot. A few more things. So you also have variables. So you know that these are parameters, which are the same as variables. So you can actually append some value to a variable. One of the things you can do is to do a lookup. So we go to a database and do a lookup. And a typical scenario of this is that let's say you do a lookup of something and then you do a for each based on that lookup, okay? That would be a typical example. Let's say a lookup of all of your clients and then you, you do a for each for each of the clients, okay? Client ID or something like that. So you can run a store procedure inside of um, a SQL database. Uh, you can actually set a variable, same as the other ones as well, append, set variable, etc. You can execute another pipeline if you want to. Fail is fail, so you reach this point, it fails the whole thing, so it, you, you can log the thing. Um, web is to run and get something from the web. Webhook is just to execute something on the web, uh, so you execute the, the web thing. Wait is good, so sometimes you have things wait, like uh, mixing with uh, things like uh, an until. So let's say you wait every five seconds until um, until you do a polling. So every five seconds you do a polling inside. So you do, let's say you do an until, and then the content inside would be a thing like, wait five seconds and do a polling to see if the service is already running. And before that you had something like start the service or something like that. So you start the service, wait until it's actually running. And every five seconds you have an endless loop that says, is it running already? Is it running already? Once it's running, you jump out and you continue until it's not processing, you have to wait, okay? So the wait here is actually very useful for that. As I mentioned, you also have for each, you have ifs. So you can jump from an if to another. So if something goes true, you do something inside. If it is false, you do something inside. That's the false part. Inside of this, you have sub pipelines smaller pipelines inside. Switch is the same as if, but with multiple conditions, same as uh, uh, what you get in C or Java or something. And you can also run Azure Machine Learning as well uh, from inside. So from the Azure Machine Learning infrastructure, and you can even run HD inside. So you have Spark also inside of HD inside. So it's a different offering, similar to Databricks, similar to, uh, to others, although HD inside will only create one cluster for you for each of these. You can run a dupe stuff uh, inside of HD inside. So you can actually run from here and set up the pipeline from here. Last but not least, you can add a trigger, as I mentioned. So you can say trigger now just to run it now, or you can say new and edit and create a trigger that runs at midnight or something like that. So that's easy. And remember at the end, they will show up literally here in the manage. So the triggers will show up here, okay? All of these, uh, all of these boxes that you just saw have linked services. So they will be able to execute things here or there. So linked services will actually be a place where you store things like the equivalent of connection strings to Cosmos DB, connection strings to databases like SQL database, but also connections to all of the services where you ask to execute, like a Databricks, you ask to execute things there, okay? Anyway, uh, having said this, uh, I think that I've exceeded 
time a bit and I do apologize for that, okay? Uh, but these things are always so interesting and there is more and more every day. So it makes it very difficult for me to be able to uh, not show everything. But in any case, uh, uh, hopefully there is still some time for, for questions and uh, let's, let's answer some of the questions here. Okay, um, so uh, I did have an answer here before that says first row is equal to two was the parameter. We'll skip the first row, so thank you. Uh, I never memorize this. Sometimes I think about underscores and things like that. So if you add, well, when I had the problems with the data types because I didn't skip the row. So um, we have an answer here that says first row is equal to two. So thank you very much, Alexander. Um, this will this will be perfect. Can you use F sharp instead of C sharp? Well, uh, this is also a curiosity I have, so I haven't really tried it. Uh, it is .NET in theory, uh, so uh, I haven't tried anything other than C sharp. But I, I'm considering it maybe F sharp Visual Basic might actually work because it's the .NET infrastructure. But I'm not sure if you need to add anything to the libraries for Spark to actually run it. To be honest, I don't know, but possibly in the future, yes, uh, but I have not tried it. Or maybe now, but I have not tried it. Uh, so if anyone knows the answer, please let me know and I'll make sure that I'll add this to the information in the future, okay? Uh, so Artur, I'm not sure if you have any uh, other questions.